everybody! Another episode of the Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. Tonight, episode 87, and we are talking about physical fitness and bushcrafting. And the question has been posed uh, to myself, Ben might have been asked it, I've seen it on web forums and everything else. To get into bushcrafting, camping, hiking, all that stuff, do you have to be in peak physical condition? Um, long, or sorry, short answer, of course not. Long answer, the better condition you're in, the more you potentially might get out of it. Uh, it it's kind of a broad subject in there, but uh, hello, Bushcraft Nick. Welcome to the show. Uh, what's what's your opening thoughts, Ben, before we jump into this and delve into it too heavy? I think, for me, it's not that you have to be in great physical shape, but you have to know the shape you're in and your limitations, because there's a there's millions of things you can do in bushcraft and some of them are limited by the shape you're in. But the reality is you can always find something that you're capable of doing. And if you want to get into shape, doing what you can will help progress that. But yeah, there's, there is a limitation that you need to keep in mind. You don't start off carrying a 50 pound rock sack, 30 kilometers a, a day and think that you're going to be able to do that on a sedentary lifestyle on the flip side anyone can go for a short stroll and you know sit on a rock and carve some sticks and play and set up a campground close to a vehicle i mean anyone can do certain lim limits of it so it's it is a broad spectrum for fitness and it's very interesting i think this is going to be a very interesting topic as we get further and further into this but uh, that's my broad thoughts from the beginning is it's it's open to all levels of physical fitness and capabilities and that's kind of where my thoughts lay on it too uh hey steve welcome to the show um so yeah let, let's start right at the start here and i guess we're both kind of on the same thought process so this is let's look at that short answer a little bit and expand it out much like you said no you don't have to be in peak physical condition to get out there do some camping bushcrafting anything like that but like ben said you do have to know how fit you are and what you are capable of so you don't get yourself into any kind of danger so as ben kind of alluded to there if you live a sedentary lifestyle you're a desk jockey you don't really do a whole lot of outdoor stuff or outside stuff when you're home you don't do the gym you know you don't have an active lifestyle well that might mean if you're going out bushcrafting uh maybe you're just going to do an overnight and you're going to camp literally beside your vehicle like, it, it's a place to start, it, it, and you can kind of judge your your fitness from there. Were you good with that? Do you want to go a little further into the woods? Uh, I mean, my opinion on that would be if you don't have a baseline for yourself, at least it's something you can expand on. And as you're expanding on it, you're going to actually develop that physical fitness. The good thing about bushcrafting, in my opinion, is even by doing very little in the bushcrafting world, you are still working on your physical fitness. There's uh, always a bit of conditioning going on regardless of what you're doing. Uh, it, literally, just going out in the woods and sitting around a campfire, setting up your hammock and stuff like that is going to burn more calories uh, and work more muscles than if you're just sitting at home like we're doing here tonight in front of our computers, chatting away or typing away. Like It's just the way it works. Um, now, on the flip side of that, like Ben said, if you try and throw on a 50 pound backpack, which is light for me, of course, we all know this. <laughs> and you try to walk four or five kilometers into the, st like, uh, well, not even that. Uh, like where we first went camping, if you tried to walk into that waterfall carrying a 50 pound sack and go up and down that hill and you have no real physical, endurance. like, yeah, like no endurance period you're going to have a bad time. It's going to leave a bad taste in your mouth at the end of it. Uh, not saying you can't do it, but it's probably not going to be enjoyable. And as your age goes up and your size goes out, like I'm finding now, uh, that can put you into a lot more risks than it would have if you did it when you're 20 and have no physical activity under your belt. So you have to keep all that kind of stuff in mind. Know your own limitations, know your own physical fitness, and know your own health. And uh, I mean you kind of have to be brutally honest with yourself at that. You definitely do. And I hope I never get as old as you. I mean, seriously. <laughs> yeah. Like Steve said, don't give yourself a heart attack 10 kilometers in the woods. I mean, no. um, 
all joking aside, uh, I, I'm my mid thirties. Uh, I don't get out in the woods as much as I used to. And I'm crouching up somewhere around 300 pounds. Um, but I still like, I do my firewood, which, uh, I did six cord this year. I still do some walking. I, um, I, even at work, even though it's a desk position, I, I spend a lot of time walking around inside the building. So, I mean, you would be surprised at how much you actually do without knowing it, but you have to be aware, <laughs> like you have to kind of take a step back and actually explore those ideas in your head. Does that make any kind of sense, Ben? Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Oh, what I want to sort of get to is yeah, I hear what you're saying. You have to know what you're capable of. You have to know that like everyone who's, who's, who's even semi-active has reached a certain level of fitness, but you want to start with anything. I think kind of slow, just something that's not vastly different in your everyday expenditure. Does that make sense? Am I going too far off here? No, I, I think it's the same thing. It's kind of one of those things that's a little harder to put into words. And I think that's what's going to make this show so good is because we're going to we're going to kind of dig things up as we're trying to. But what you need to keep in, in mind is you may look at a trip. You, you plan a trip. This is something that I, I tend to do a fair bit. I'll look at a map. I'll look at, at it. I figure out, you know, strike distance. I'm going to plan on doing seven kilometers, but then you realize the trail on the train, you're, you're probably going to walk closer to 12 kilometers before you get there. And there's going to be this involved and that involved. There's something steep hills and stuff. And you're saying, well, that doesn't sound like that much. 12 kilometers isn't that much, but then you got to think about it. I don't normally walk 12 kilometers in a day. Uh, I'm going to have a pack on my back. I'm going to have, you know, limited food. I can't stop every five minutes to eat like if i'm used to snacking all day or whatever so you think about how you do everything and then think about how is that going to affect me now if you're used to doing this you're going to set yourself up for more of this stuff and you're going to say okay i know i can do 12 i know that these hills are within what i'm, I'm used to doing i know the weight is heavy because i've carried bigger packs for longer distances or anything as you get into this you'll a find a gear you actually need when you get you're fresh into it. You won't have that. Every You tend to carry more stuff the fresher you are, more weight anyways. Um, so set goals small, I think, is important. And know your fitness. Because if you push yourself too far and you get too exhausted, your risk of injury and, and incidents go up. Because if you're exhausted, you're going to trip. You're going to slip. You're going to fall. Much more likely. Um yeah, uh, the, I was trying to think of the term, and you've seen you're bringing it up, it, it, uh, exhaustion clumsiness? Is, is that well, the term I'm that's... trying to think of? Or clumsy exhaustion? Or, it's something like that. I heard it just a few days ago, and I was like, that's going to be great for this week, and of course I forgot it. But anyway. Yeah, but it's, it is a real thing. Is is the, the more tired you get, the less you pay attention to your steps, the, less, the more you tend to stumble, fall, and, and make mistakes. So knowing your fitness, setting goals that, you know, are reasonable and obtainable. And I think that's the big thing with any, anything in life really is set yourself reasonable, obtainable goals. Uh, if you do that, you can always find something you can do in, in, in the wilderness that you can enjoy and set those reasonable attainable goals. And the more you do it, those reasonable attainable goals will get bigger and bigger. And by the end, stuff that you might never have even considered would be mundane to you. Uh, so I think bushcraft really can get you really fit because a lot of it, you don't, it doesn't feel like exercise going for a leisurely stroll in the woods does not feel like going for, you know, a 10 kilometer walk. It really doesn't uh, because you don't really pay attention to it. You're just enjoying yourself. Uh, when you're trying to, to start a fire with friction fire method like we tried that a few times uh i'm not going to lie and say that doesn't feel exhausting but you would do that a lot more than if you you weren't trying to start a fire you know what i mean like you'll push yourself there because it, it is kind of fun and interesting exciting when you see the smoke it gets you going things like that no i and completely agree things. um just to throw in a quick story when i was learning to do a hand drill 
I literally went so long without knowing it that I couldn't actually pick my arms up to keep trying it. I was like, no, one more time. And my arms just physically would not work. Like I, it's, you know, people were like, Oh, I can't even move my arms. And it's always kind of an, an exaggeration that in this instance, I kind of put my arms down to take a breather. Cause I could feel it all through my chest and shoulders. And I'm like, okay, one more time. And I went to pick my arms up and they just like the brain was going, pick your arms up. And it just was not happening. It actually kind of worried me for a second. I was like, oh, crap, what happened? But uh, no, like, but that's the kind of exhaustion you can get into by pushing yourself beyond your limits. And you have to be aware of that. Luckily, I was sitting outside on my pergola. So, you know, I just kind of sat there for five more minutes and it was like, all right, obviously, I'm just a little too tired to keep doing this. And things were good. But you don't want to get into a situation like that in the woods. And as I developed that uh, and kept practicing, 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 and I mean, I practiced for months to get that skill down, uh, it became easier and easier and easier. And now that I haven't done it in a year and practiced on it as much, I bet you if I went back, I'd be right back to all the, the fatigue and stuff like that. And you'd be surprised what fatigues you. You wouldn't think that, you know, just rubbing your hands together like this would, you know, literally wear you out. Oh, yeah. But it, it, yeah, it does. Every time I've tried, because I... I'm not as accomplished with the, the friction fire methods as you are. Every time I try it, I do find I'm, I'm generally exhausted at the end. It's such a lot of effort in a mo motion that I'm just not so used to doing, right? Uh, and trying to control everything, like keeping the pressure right with one hand and moving the the bow at the with, at the right speed and pressure at the other hand and holding everything so it doesn't go cockeyed and everything just flicks off into the woods and stuff like that. There's a lot to it. It's, it's it's more different. But the other like so that's a great example. The other one for me is paddling. Mm -hmm. Like I think if you put me on a machine and said I want you to paddle, I'd go on the machine and 15, 20 minutes in, I'd be exhausted. Like yeah, I'm not doing this anymore. But you put me in a canoe with a paddle, and I will canoe for hours and hours, and then come back and her I hardly even notice it till like the next day. I'm like, why is my back and and shoulders so 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 stiff and it's because i've been paddling for hours and hours and hours and moving myself through miles and miles of water but it's it just doesn't you know you you don't even think about it it's it's often you know it's it's a secondary motion if that makes sense like it's, it's at the just... time it doesn't seem exhausting but it is exhausting it's burning up energy and that's once again what you have to keep in mind when you're taking your physical fitness into account for when you want to do stuff don't assume you can paddle the 14 kilometers across a lake or up a river or something like that. And all of a sudden you get three up there and you're just pooched. Because that can happen. Yeah. I mean, that happens very easily. Yeah. Always have a backup plan if you're going to go in and you're not, you know, peak physical condition. If you want to throw that out there. I, I, when it comes to bushcrafting, I'm a firm believer in there is no such thing as peak physical condition. There is in shape for you. And what's in shape for me is different than what's in shape for uh, Ben, for instance. And what's in shape for Ben might be different than what's uh, like Gary or Steve or Carl or any of these people that are here talking to us uh, in the comments. Like our levels of fitness are all going to be different. Uh, ben, accomplished boater. He can go out and he could probably paddle circles around me in the run of a day. But I'm going to be fairly confident. I'm going to go, oh, yeah, I can keep up with Ben. No, there's not a chance in heck I can keep up with Ben, to be <laughs> honest with you. Now, the other flip of the uh, that coin is like, if we went out walking, chances are for a while I could keep up with Ben. Ben has a little longer legs, a little longer stride. I'm going to get more tired than he is. Uh, not so much a fitness thing there as it's a literal, a physical limitation, which you also have to take into account uh, as part of your fitness. If you're going out in a group, who's got the shortest legs? Because that's the person that should be setting the pace. Um, no, for sure. It's, uh Tall, lanky people can really exhaust short, stubby people. I'm not trying to pick on them. I mean, there's advantages to both. Don't don't let anyone fool you that just because you're tall and lanky, you have a huge advantage over a sh short and stubbier person. Because, and that's calling extremes. They they both have great advantages. But yeah, that one guy just making one or two steps, and the other guy doing two or three. Uh, and if the shorter guy is in better shape, he may be able to still walk that tall guy. But he's still making you know, three steps to the other guys too. Um, so that makes, that does make a difference. Oh no, for sure. You're going to, in general, 
Uh, if Ben and I went head to head, perfectly flat ground, walked in a straight line, Ben's going to take far fewer steps than I am to walk the same amount of distance. Uh, I'm going to guess your stride's like what, Ben? One and a quarter, one and a half meters? I should know that better than I do. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that ballpark. Um, so I've conditioned mine to be almost one meter. Uh, but that's actually a little further than what my normal stride would be. Like just from doing it so often, it's become my normal stride, if that makes any sense. Because I was only short by a few inches, don't get me wrong. So <laughs> ask Mel, I walk weird. Uh, if you ever see me walking in the woods, I kind of bounce when I walk, and she makes fun of me for it, for like, nonstop until she learned why I did it and she still makes fun of me, but at least now she knows why I do it. It's so I can set my pace at almost one meter, but that's of course on flat straight ground. That's going to change yeah. again, going uphill and stuff like that, which once again, taller people, uh, will have a little bit of advantage off going up hills over objects, stuff like that, that might work a little bit less. So don't expect, like, I can't set my fitness level compared to Ben, for instance, because once again, he could potentially have an easier time. Now, if it's rockier ground and stuff like that, I may have a, a potentially easier time because I am a little shorter, a little stockier. Uh, my center of gravity is a little lower. I probably won't roll my ankles and stuff quite as much as Ben would. Uh, not going to say that for sure because I'll probably roll my ankles. Don't get me wrong. But I mean, th this is all stuff that has to go in with the fitness equation if, you if you know, if there is such a thing. Yeah. Oh, and we talk about physical fitness as in, like, muscle and endurance but there's there's another side to it too um you have to take into account physical limitations and I, I always want to be a little careful when i say that but if you have bad backs if you have bad ankles if your feet aren't aren't 100 percent, or if you have any single um would infirmity be the wrong word or, or physical limitation for whatever reason know and understand that and, and make sure that you're you're using using everything to its best advantage so if for whatever reason you do have a bad back you want to be, you want to be a lot more careful with the gear you pack so that you don't aggravate and 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 make that worse on a trip so if you you have a bad back carry a heavy pack and carry it poorly loaded and it's not poorly fit or properly fitted at the end of a trip that's going to be three, four, five times harder on you than it, it should have been. And it could leave you at the point where you can't make it out. Uh, and I mean, that's something that you always have to keep in mind. This is, this is what I'm capable of. I know this. I'm comfortable with this. This is what I want to do. And if they're greatly afar apart, you're going to have to make some accommodations. How are you going to make bridge that gap of what I know I can do and what I want to do? And just thinking you can push through and and man up, uh, as some people might tell you, is not the solution. It's the solution is knowing your limitations, adapting to those. And sometimes that's adapting gear. Sometimes that's adapting a trip, taking an extra day uh, so you can spread the load out, um, accepting help from others or, or just using different methods to, to gain that same thing. Um, never be too proud to to accept that, that there are some things you can't do the way you want to do them 100%, but that rarely means you can't do them at all. Uh, I'm a firm believer that most people can accomplish most things if they put their mind to it and take the time to, to really think it through. No, I completely agree. I was just kind of glancing at some comments over there. Uh, Gary, for instance, says his wife complains about uh, his pace walking. He can wear her out if he's not careful because he has a much larger stride. Uh, and Steve mentioned, just for example, uh, walking his chihuahuas. As an extreme case in point, one stride for him is like 10 for the dog. Now, Melissa and I, we both have 28-inch inseams, like literally the exact same inseam. Uh, my stride's longer than hers just because of the way I walk. And if I'm not careful, she's almost to a jog to try and keep up with my fast stride. So like if, if I actually hammer down and I'm going to, you know, put some distance at a good fast pace, uh, when I worked for DNR, we used to do something called pack testing. Um, and at the start of every year, you had to carry so much weight and cover so much distance to be able to prove you could physically do the job. They didn't want you dropping dead in the woods. Made sense. 
Uh, but the pace that you had to do for that was roughly, uh, what was it? You had to do three miles in 45 minutes. Yeah, so you had to do a mile in 15 minutes. And that pace just kind of got stuck in my head, which is, it's a quick walk for anybody that has shorter legs. Uh, it's yeah. actually a pretty good walk for people with longer legs. And that pace always got stuck on my head because I was always trained for the pack test in those times. I, I worked for Natural Resources for almost 10 years. So, I mean, it stuck with me for a while. It still sticks with me. And I trained for that and trained for that. So that became my pace. Um, and, yeah, unfortunately, Melissa, I can, I can, you know, she's got bad ankles. She's got a bad hip. And if she tries to stay up with me and doesn't mention anything, I could potentially really hurt her in the woods uh, by doing nothing more than going too fast for her. Yeah, a hundred percent. I have uh, I have had similar complaints from my wife sometimes walk that it's hard to keep up with, and I and I don't notice it for me. Like my pace is my pace is my pace, and that's what I'm comfortable walking. And I don't always pay attention to others in, but I also kind of use that to their advantage too. Because honestly, if I'm say we're doing a portage, I'll take my gear and stuff and I'll go. Oftentimes I'll get to the end and be part way back and they're still coming for the first trip, but I'll go back and get anything else. And sort of in the end, we're all more or less caught up. And I, you know, I help them out with that and I'll do that as long as I can. At some point, I assume that maybe age and infirmities may limit that I, I could be the slow one in the bunch. But I mean, it's, the more you keep up to it, the more you do it, I think the longer that potential loss would be and doing something you really enjoy we talked about the paddling we talked about the fire it it really is going to help get you in that shape because the more you you do it because you love it and you, if you never think of it as exercise but just if you went out i guarantee you if you went out and did uh you know 20 kilometers a day every weekend camping you would be in pretty good shape you would easily be able to say i can I can do most trips. I could attempt things like, you know, the Appalachian Trail, things like that. It would be conceivable, uh, which is is a is a big task. Um, As for somebody like me right now, if somebody's like, "Oh, hey, you want to go do the Appalachian Trail?" I'd be like, "Yeah, I'd love to do it." Realistically, I'm going to die about halfway through it. <laughs> See, I think you'd feel like you were going to die but halfway through it, but I think somewhere around there, you would realize that you're now in better shape than you'd ever expect it to be, and you'd be used to it. I think the first week would be rough. I really do. I think the absolute worst would be your first week to week and a half because you're really kind of getting into stride. After that, your body's really going to kind of get used to it. Your cycle gets straightened out, and you'll you'll have it down to a pattern. And by the end, you'll be doing more kilometers per day than you did your first week. Uh, but your first week's going to be rough. No doubt about it in my mind. First two or three days, you're going to be sore. And every day after that, you're going to lose a little bit of weight. You're going to gain a little bit of mu muscle mass. And it's just going to be, you're going to adapt. Your body overall would adapt to this thing. But you'd have to be doing it at a fairly consistent basis. Uh, and that's the thing is most of us are a bit of weekend warriors for this. Like, you know, we're stuck with our regular jobs during the week and we can do this on the weekends. If we could, you know, give it all up, and if anyone can figure it out, send me the information. I'm, I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah, none of our schemes uh, seem to be working so far. So. <laughs> Uh, and do this, you know, on a daily basis. Like somebody says, Ben, we're we're hiring guides to take people in the backwoods every day, and I'd be like, sign me up, just to show show me where I go. <laughs> no, hundred percent. And Gary makes a good point here too. Winter solo camping uh, is a workout. Getting there in the wood prep and all that stuff. Uh, just being outside in the winter, just sitting, burns more calories than just sitting in the summer. Your body has to expend calories to keep you warm. So uh, not necessarily getting you fit, but no. you have to keep in mind that that's going to wear you out faster. Your body's still burning up fuel. 
Uh, yep. Once again, just something else to take into consideration for the fitness equation. You don't have to be in great shape. You can't be in terrible shape or you're basically going to be beside the car. But that's still perfectly ex acceptable. That's still getting out. That's still learning. That's still developing. And that's still building fitness for later. So it, it's just... And I think we've said it multiple times through this whole thing. And it's the number one golden rule for this is know your limits, know your capabilities, and know your health for for your determining your fitness level, so to speak. Just stay within your boundaries. If you want to push yourself a little bit, that's okay. We, we grow as people by pushing ourselves a little bit. But don't go nuts. Don't go extreme. Don't go into the danger zone. Um if that makes any kind of sense. Don't look at a guy who camps absolutely every weekend, who's, who's a bit of a fitness nut, and he says, I do this trail in three days all, all the time. It's super easy. And you go to do it, and the first day you barely make it to a camp, and you're still looking at it, and I got two more days of this, and you're going you're gonna to realize you really should have three or four more days of this mm. because that guy is chewing up kilometers at a much faster rate than you are and by setting yourself to someone else's pace you're really setting yourself up for a failure i think potentially um set yourself up for your pace set your own goals and then if you can beat those the next trip if you can push yourself a little bit further do some more side trips and all that awesome you've really accomplished a major accomplishment and the more you do that i think the, the better it is the only person in the world you should ever compete against really is yourself. Be the better, more knowledgeable person than you were the day before. Be the stronger person than you were the day before. If you look at life that way, I think you're, we'd all be a lot happier and more enjoyable. Oh, I and agree. A hundred percent. If you're at bushcrafting, trust me, you're going to be happy. <laughs> I've never come out of the woods angry. You know what yeah. I mean? I, I, that's a lot. I've come out of the woods annoyed. I've never come out of the roads and, uh, angry cause, and usually I come out annoyed because, you know, uh, I missed a deer or I lost a piece of gear or something crazy like that, but never angry. Uh, and, and Steve just made a good point here too, that I'd like to bring up. And, and you talked about this too, Ben, so you can, uh, feel a little bit more in on this, but good gear is a factor too. Good shoes, good socks, even a sharp knife or hatchet as opposed to a doll uh as opposed to dull uh which increases effort all things complain to fatigue enjoy yourself don't torture yourself and we say that almost on every episode yeah i 100 percent agree with that sentiment uh we have often used backpacks as an example for that a good proper backpack that fits well and holds the weight in the correct way is not going to exhaust you if you got a big floppy pack backpack and the gears load it incorrectly you're putting a lot of effort and strength into holding yourself upright if it's flopping around, that's constant. Every step, it's it's throwing your weight off. You're compensating for that. It's like walking two, three times the distance. So a poor backpack, if ill-fitting shoes, it's going to wear at your feet. You're going to start walking funny to avoid those hot spots on your feet. So now you're going to be wearing at your legs. You're going to be just moving your body in a way it's not meant to. It's not natural. It's not comfortable. So you're going to get not only fatigue, but you're going to risk injury and stuff. Uh, this this goes right through all your gear. Find gear that fits properly, that works well. Uh, find gear that does the job that you need it to do and only take the gear that you really need to take or, or that is a safety concern if you don't take it. So I'm not telling someone, don't take a first aid kit because it's more weight and you're not planning on using it. That's a horrible idea. Take the first aid kit so you never need it. But don't take two because cooking pots when one's going to do the job. No. And don't take a cast iron when you can get away with, a, a, you know, a, a, a thin steel one or a, an aluminum one or a titanium one. If you can take a smaller, lighter pot, take the smaller, lighter pot. Uh, if it means it's going to take a little longer to cook your meal because you, you only have one pot. That's what you're out there for. You're going to say, enjoy yourself. Do you have a time? And maybe you do have a time frame. I don't know. But I mean, generally, when I go to the woods, I'm pretty lax with my time frames. I mean, the last yeah. time you and I went out, we had a itinerary of things we wanted to accomplish. And it was like 10 long, and we got three or four of them done. Yeah. So, I mean, that, yeah. that's just how it goes. Don't try and 
kill yourself in the woods. It, it defeats the purpose. And realistically, you may be endangering yourself if you push yourself beyond that. Like, uh, using this example with Ben and I again, like, we wanted to accomplish setting up our camps. Uh, we were going to try and make some camp chairs. Uh, we want to do the, I guess this is the previous, the first time we went out, but we wanted to do the traps. Um, and then as we got in and there was a bunch of other stuff, I can't remember what it was now because it's been a couple of years, but as we got out there, I remember we found a log and we talked about splitting that and we kind of ran out of time. And I mean, it was no problem. We were kind of, you know, bummed we didn't get to do it, but at the same time, we truly enjoyed what we were out there doing. Um, and if you try and set on realistic goals for yourself, which we kind of did, unfortunately, uh, we had just too many goals for the time frame we were going to be out there. It was, uh, it, it kind of takes away from the whole experience. You know what I mean? But the good side of that is if you do set, you know, goals that aren't obtainable, recognize, we recognized when we were out there that it wasn't going to happen. So we just focused on the major ones and really enjoyed what we did. And we still had a great time. Uh, ben caught some fish. I drowned some pepperettes. Uh, we did get around to doing a couple traps. We never did get to make the camp chairs in either of the times out because it always dropped to the bottom of the list. But I mean, uh, yeah. we still had a really good time out there. And if we tried to do this stuff, we might have pushed ourselves a little further than we were really capable of for the time we went out because both times were only out for two days. Well, I think with anything, it's great to have lots of things things planned to do. It never hurts to have ideas that you want to work on, goals you want to get to. But um, what it does hurt to do is insist on this. The, the, the main priority for me, and I think it is for you, is to get out there and enjoy myself. And so once you realize that your goals, and if, as long as they're not goals that are essential to survival and comfort. So the goal to set up a good camp we always meet that one, you know, the goal to have, you know, a cook fire. We always meet that one. The goal to build bushcraft chairs. That's there. If we have spare time, if we're bored, that's something we're going to work on. At least that we myth barely of spare ever have time. <laughs> spare time. But that's the thing is, have you met your major goals? And your major goals are ones that you kind of have to meet. And everything else is, is on a priority list. And it's good to have those options. And sometimes it could be down to, you know, I had a goal to make it to these three campsites, but on day two, the wind was way too bad. and There's no way I was making it to the other campsite safely. So my decision was to stick to campsite, you know, the, the campsite I spent on it day one. That's fine. Since now I'm there and I've already got camp set up, well, and now I'm going to be there for at least another day. Now is when I, maybe I'm going to look at my longer list and say, well, how about I attempt to perfect, you know, friction fire? How about I try to make the bushcraft chair? Or how about I work on how to make primitive fish hooks? All these things are good goals and worth trying. But there are, they're there on my list. Or maybe it's just to try and identify some rocks that could be used as chariot or, or like flint-like material. I know it's kind of hard to find around here, but it's always a fun thing to try and just test and see how different rocks react. So things like that. And all these things are going to get you out there doing more stuff and, and stuff uh, and, and enjoying it. But the first goal is to get out there and enjoy yourself. And if your other goals become the main goal, if fitness became your main goal, then I think it's going to take away from everything else. Your first goal should always be, in my opinion, to get out there, enjoy yourself, and learn. And then from there, expand. No, I completely agree. And just as a uh, point or fact in point, um, the one thing that always seems to get a lot of people, and I, I find myself uh, sometimes getting caught up in this, is nobody ever realizes how much firewood they actually need for one night. And how much time it takes to gather that firewood. And how much energy it takes to process that firewood. Um, so anybody that's out there thinking about fitness. Uh, I know it's a little late in the show to put this out there. But if you're thinking about your fitness level and stuff like that. Allow yourself a very healthy bulk portion 
off your assessment towards firewood and firewood processing if you're going to be staying, uh, especially if you're staying multi-nights and you are going to um, uh, cook on your fire and stuff like that. It's not so bad if you're just going to make kind of like a, a, a quick fire, maybe have a few wobbly pops, something like that chat with friends, and then it's going to go out and everything's good. But most times when Ben and I go out, we try to have a sustainable fire to at least some degree that you can flare up. That way, if you have to purify some water or you want to cook a quick bite to eat, or if you want to get warmed up because the weather is getting cooler now or something like that, it's as simple as just raking the coals, throw a few pieces on, there's fire. But to or you a can't find any falls in the river. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, maybe you have to dry a boot. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, realistically, there is a ton of effort um, and energy that goes into just firewood. And a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people underestimate that. And just the sheer amount you need to keep a fire through the night, uh, a lot of people underestimate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I get, once again, the, the, the big point of that was if you are assessing your uh, fitness based on this podcast we're doing, if you're planning to go out and you're planning to have a sustainable fire or any kind of fire, consider a major bulk of your effort being expended is going to be for gathering, processing, and maintaining your fire. Yeah, yeah, especially if you're doing true backwoods camping. Like, if you're going to Kedgy, I'm not knocking Kedgy because I love Kedgy, but if you're going to, say, Kedgy, a lot of that firewood and stuff is provided in campsites. But even some of those, you still have to go to another site to bring it over now because they have a dumping site. Hmm. And then uh, we locked out the last few trips. There's been enough wood or plenty of wood on a lot of the sites, so it hasn't been a big deal. But uh, I can imagine there's a couple of sites I've been to where the, the nearest dump site is actually like a lake away. Uh, so I think we were in Mountain Lake and Corbell Lake is actually where the dump station is supposed to be. Uh, there's just a channel between the two. So that, that would have been if you would had a hard day portage and, and paddling to get to it, which we had a relatively full day doing it, it would have been pretty uh, upsetting even to go through all that effort to get there and then finally you know it's getting dark and you had to go quite a distance away because you're not allowed to cut wood but in a true backwoods camping you'll pick up your dead wood and stuff you you know um but you have to process it it's it's long trees it needs to be cut down to a reasonable size that takes time and effort it doesn't take long to burn off two three hours like you said it can be spent gathering enough firewood to get you through the evening well, once again, I'm thinking our second trip more so. We probably dedicated between two of us three hours nonstop gathering firewood. Like full yeah. tree lengths. We were dra it, lucky where we were. There was a lot of deadfall, water, uh, like good firewood. But it was yeah. tree length. So we had to haul all that over. I would haul stuff over. Ben would cut. When Ben would get tired, he would haul stuff over. I would cut. And I mean, we went like that basically for three hours straight and it was tiring because I mean, yeah. you can do the old, just throw your sticks in and keep pulling them in as they burn away, which is not so bad for at night and stuff like that, especially if you got some bigger stuff. Um, but realistically, you're still going to want to process some of that down. And what do you have on you to process that down? We had the benefit of, I took an ax, Ben took a saw. There was two of us. We had our bases covered. If you're going in by yourself, that might be a question you have to ask yourself. Do you want to bring both? Do you just want to bring one or the other? Yeah. And if you are just bringing an axe, realize you now have to chop all your wood down into lengths if you are going to do that with an axe, which is going to be a ton of effort over a saw. But if you bring a saw, you now have to split all your wood, if you're going to split wood, uh, with a knife or something like that. Like you're going to have to baton it to get your kingling. So th there's trade-offs to everything. But once again, main point is ton of effort gets put into that one thing and it is really readily overlooked by a lot of novice and even a lot of experienced people yeah and then that's the old rule of thumb once you think you have enough wood go get at least that much again oh man uh, i've been the rule 
the rule of thumb I go with is get enough firewood, or once you have enough firewood that you think will last the night, go yeah. get twice that again. So you end up with three times the amount you originally thought. And I mean, that yeah. might be a little overkill. The twice the amount actually sounds more reasonable. But I mean, there's different ones. I've heard four times the amount. I've heard five times the amount. Uh, but I think that kind of goes with uh, skill level two. I know that, you know, a handful of wood like this is realistically going to last about 30 minutes when you're burning a fire. Because that's just going to get you going. Like, you yeah. need a good amount of wood. Anybody that's ever burnt wood in a wood stove, just imagine how fast your wood burns up if you've never shut the door and you leave the draft straight open. Because that's yeah. basically what you're doing. There's no way to dampen this fire down. It's just burning flat out all times. Even hot hot tent camping in, in the winter with my little ammo can stove. And I mean, that's not a very big stove. And as such, I'm burning small wood. I'm burning stuff that's, you know, thumb size and slightly bigger. Um, maybe, the, maybe some of the biggest things are the size of this, the end of this mag, like, you know, maybe an inch across, uh, inch and a half, maybe. Uh, and, and that, like when I was doing that, I would take a solid, like what I could get my whole arms around. I take about two of those in with me and I use up at least one in a night. If I was going all night, if I was waking up and stacking her up. I was waking up probably every 15, 30 minutes and putting that much in again. And in the evening when I was getting everything ready, I was going through it even faster. Like I wouldn't let it burn down much. Uh, if, if you have an open fire, you're going through it at two, three times the pace. Like you need quite a bit. So keep that in mind. Uh, but gathering the firewood is fun. Oh, yeah, it. it's a good thing. And like you said, I, I didn't really mean for it to turn into a talk about firewood. Uh, but, yeah, it, it is a fun activity. Uh, it's a very rewarding activity, too, because when you're sitting there at night and you're warm and you're watching the glow of the fire, you have that, yeah, I, I did that. I built that fire. I'm maintaining that fire. Like, uh, you know what I mean? It's it, it's a very satisfying feeling. But it, it just, you also realize as that's going through your head is, holy crap, that was a lot of work. But where it is something I've always enjoyed, again, I, I don't find it to be the the kind of work that other things are. Like to me, it's it's the easiest exercise because I enjoy it and it's it's what I'm there for. I think if you were into any sport, like when guys play hockey, when they're playing the hockey, they never think of it as an, an exhausting thing. It's what they were, you know, to just goal anti oriented. They just need to get to the puck. They need to need to get a shot. With camping, it's the same thing. I need to get to my campsite. I need to get my firewood. I need to get this. I need to get that. These are the goals. These are the the the, the things you aim for, and you don't think about the effort you put into it until it's done. And you sit back at the end of the night. You have your your cup of chaga and your your campfire sitting there, and maybe a nice wiener over the fire. And you sit there and you say, "Geez, I did good work today. I I I." You know, I, I paddled 12 kilometers, I portaged six kilometers, I got, you know, you know, five good size arm loads of, of solid wood to burn for the night. I got two or three bundles of small wood. I got this, that, and the other thing. I seen that beautiful sunset. I got to see the eagle flying over here. I seen deer down in the valley. You think about all the things you've seen and did, and it just, you have such so, so satisf satisf satisfaction. Satisfaction. <laughs> of of your accomplishments and the peace of mind that all that brought you because when you're out there and you're seeing all this stuff it just to me it, it makes it all seem so much better and as such you you're passively getting in better shape and better at fitness and you're you're growing as a person and it's better than going to the gym because like you said well it's not better than going to the gym it's nicer than going to the gym because like you said it doesn't feel like you're working at it you're just out having fun there's, I, I'm like going to gym there's no one there judging you <laughs> unless you go with Ben and you fall in the wolf of the water <laughs> oh buddy oh well you, you go back with me anytime <laughs> If anybody's wondering what we're joking about, first time we went out, literally within 10 minutes, I had slipped and went right to, must have been about halfway to my knee into the water. My boot was wet all that day. 
It's funny, you know, everyone who goes camping with me ends up wet. I think that's a topic for a different kind of show. <laughs> but, well, I was thinking Jeremy, Jeremy sunk his canoe or his kayak. I mean, you, you fell on the river. Does that mean you're bad luck? That's, I think I'm bad luck. Yeah. <laughs> or you're just, you're shooing away your bad luck. So you all you have is good luck. That's why I didn't catch any fish. It was you. Tell me, buddy. Tell now me. I've gone fishing again, and I've had bad luck. I have caught some fish this year, so things are good. But I actually got uh, my first bass this year. That was fun. Um, anyway, I digress. So, yeah, uh, long story short, do you have to be physically fit? No. We said that at the start. Uh, you have to be aware of your fitness level. You have to accept your fitness level. Don't be like... And I, I don't want to pick on anybody's age or anything like that, but don't be in your late fifties, probably a hundred pounds over weight going, Oh yeah, I can do 20 miles today. That's no problem. Or 20 kilometers or wherever you happen to be. Um, be realistic with yourself. Be like, all right. In my case. Yeah. I'm mid thirties. I'm not in the best of shape. Uh, I'm upwards of 300 pounds. I'm probably not going to do 20 clicks today, but I could probably do seven kilometers today. And get there and have enough energy to get my camp set up, do my firewood. Like, that. that's realistic. Just be real with yourself. I mean, Ben said it earlier in the show. You're not competing with anyone but yourself. So who are you trying to impress? Who Who's going to make fun of you? Who, any of that, it doesn't matter. If you're going with friends, hopefully they're actually your friends. And they'll be happy that you're trying to take care of yourself. And in the end taking care of them because if you got a guy down in the woods you now have become a liability you're no longer a dependent or uh, an asset you're you're a liability so you don't want to put them out you don't want to put yourself out so just be honest with yourself recognize where you are and treat it accordingly yeah and 100 percent. like when i go camping with other people i i think of two things one i don't want to slow them down too much because because i had that pride but two if anyone's going with me and i think that they might not be able to keep up the first thing I do is try figuring out how can I adjust the trip so that we all come out of this as enjoyable. I don't care if I do 20 kilometers in a day. I don't care if I do 10 kilometers a day. I care that everyone that leaves with me makes it there in an enjoyable fashion. Um, that means sometimes when I'm planning a trip, I have to adapt the trip. Or sometimes when I, I, I'm doing a trip, I may not invite somebody who i feel that this is not a trip they're going to enjoy for various reasons if i have a trip plan and i'm looking at it, i'm thinking gee you know if i go out there with jim and jim really you know he's got he's got this he's got that he's not used to paddling maybe we should look at this trip this would be a better trip or if i'm going with a bunch of guys that are hardcore i'm not inviting jim on that trip because jim isn't accommodated to that trip he's not going to enjoy it because he's going to just going to feel he's dragging people down and the other guys may eventually uh they may not care that this they're not getting the distance but i don't want anyone to feel off i don't feel anyone they're not going to reach their goals so you really do plan these things out right plan your trip for the people you're going with and make sure that it's just something you're going to be enjoying and i think in the end you know everyone's going to have a much better time and, and it's going to be Right? And it, the next trip, if you want to do more, if you did a trip where you did half the distance you wanted to and you got there and everyone was saying, like, that was too quick, that was too short. Now you know for the next time, plan more. You know, I think you're much better off to planning a bit of extra time in your trip, planning that buffer than planning it to the point where it's so tight you can't meet the goals yourself mm. and then fail because – you can put yourself in a poor position. You can put yourself in a position to make bad, bad decision after bad decision. I think that's how people end up sometimes in trouble. People bite off more they can chew than they make bad decisions. Well, I got to make it to the campsites, and now they're canoeing and paddling and and portaging at night, and now they're missing trails, and it's getting worse and worse. The next thing you know, somebody uh, is hurt, injured, or lost. So, plan what you can do. Know what you can do. Set your Set your goals reasonable and push yourself on reasonable things. And if you want to push a lot, make those the extras. 
make it side trips when you get to main base. And then you can make the decision if you're going to do it or not, or if you're going to cut it short. Uh, so there's a lot of options. But the main goal is always to get out there and enjoy yourself. No, um, couldn't set it better myself. So to kind of wrap up tonight, uh, let's answer a great question from Steve. And it's something we haven't actually chatted about it yet. I did have a footnote about it, but I kind of glanced, glossed over it. Uh, mm -hmm. Steve says, how much does weather play into fatigue? Raining, sun, cold? And we did talk about the cold a little bit. You burn a few extra calories. But, great point. If it's raining, uh, windy, really hot, all of that's going to add more more effort into the trip right so i mean if you go camping dead of summer like end of august we've had times when it's like 42 degrees with the humidity humidity plays a huge part in how much your strength gets zapped out of you i mean realistically my seven kilometers or 10 kilometers i was hoping to accomplish today may go down to three three and a half at best just because i'm going to be walking a lot slower i'm going to be sipping my water i mean my 50 pound rucksack or uh, backpack is now going to feel like a hundred pounds by the time i walk for a kilometer and it, it's a good point you have to take all of that into account uh when you're assessing your fitness level because i i guess honestly assess your fist uh, yeah assess your fitness level for every trip you're going to do because there are so many external factors your personal physical fitness is really hard to base on that you know you're okay you know what you're not going to die from a walk that's great but does that mean you're not going to die from a walk in ideal conditions does that mean you can do the same walk when it's 42 degrees in the humidity does that mean you can do the same walk in three feet of snow like all of this plays into it uh and rain just being wet adds a lot more weight into your stuff. Uh, one thing I can think off with rain is, and it's not really camping, but just to give you an idea of it, uh, I had a weather race suit when I was on the motorcycle. Uh, I used to travel from Bedford Highway to Middle... To, well, Middle Muscadaba came later, but Sheet Harbor, which was a two-hour drive. And it rained on the way back. And that suit had to have been... 110 pounds by the time I got it off. Like, it was just waterlogged. And, I mean, yeah. it was so heavy. It was exhausting just sitting on the motorcycle. So, nice. same thing plays when you're camping. If you start getting wet and start soaking up water, it's going to restrict your movements, which you're going to have to expend more effort to move. Not only that, it's going to add weight. Yeah. yeah. So, what's your uh, thoughts yeah. on weather? Rain. Uh, let's just, just hit, hit them one at a time. Same thing. Like the extra weight that the rain can put into it, the extra gear you're going to wear to try and keep yourself dry, you're you're, you're pushing your body through that. You're dealing with that. That adds on the ground getting muddy. It means the mud's going to stick to your boots potentially. You're going to be walking through puddles. All that sort of stuff drags on it. Wind, uh, especially if you're canoeing or kayaking, you're on open water. Wind has a huge effect on how many how much distance you can you can cover. Paddling into the wind. You could be doing three, four paddles for what one paddle was getting. You know what I mean? Like it really cuts down the distance and increases the effort. I've been in wind where I the best I could do was paddle backwards. You know what I mean? Like I'm paddling and just losing distance. I'm controlling my loss, but that's the best I can do until the gust ends. I've had to paddle so that I basically just get to the other side, look for leewards and, and, and take alternate routes to get back because the wind was so bad. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, sun, like you said, sun, heat exhaustion is something you have to avoid. So sometimes you have to cut your, your expectations down just so you don't put yourself into a huge problem. In the winter, snow, uh, it's, it's brutal walking through snow and the cold temperature. Uh, the nice thing with the cold temperature is you don't overheat as quick. But you'd have to worry that you're wearing more clothes and you're going to have to control your clothes. You know, the last thing you want to do is sweat in the cold because you sweat, you die is the old saying, right? So, yeah, weather is a huge factor. and It's always something to be calculated into your trips uh, and always plan for the worst case. Like, you know, what if it does snow storm? What if it is a huge rain? What if I do get wind blow? What if, what if? You have to plan these in. I always kind of have in the back of my mind i'm mentally prepared for one extra day at least on every trip i did um, and we've mentioned that many times in the show 
Uh, and it's part of the safety. Like we always talk a bit of here about safety and, and fitness is no, no different, you know, being prepared for the trip and being fit for the trip and planning for what you're doing and adjusting so that, you know, you can do it, but always plan for something extra. I always plan for that extra day, that extra kilometer, that extra meal, uh, extra, I always plan for that extra cold or that, that extra hot. So you have some options. So, you know, you're fitting in here. This is what you expect, but always be prepared for a bit more, at least a bit more. Uh, and to me, it's almost like an insurance. Like if you plan for it, chances are it'll never happen. But if you didn't plan for it, it's surprising how often it is exactly what happens. Uh, You'll hear people joke about it all the time with snowblowers and stuff like that. Oh, you don't have to worry about it snowing this year. I bought a snowblower. If you didn't buy, buy one, you'd have 10 feet of snow. And it's the same kind of thing out there for whatever reason. I guess Murphy's Law or something like that. I, I don't know what law it would be. But anyway, if you don't prepare for it, chances are that's exactly what's going to happen. Doesn't work for me. I hate snowblowers. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, uh, we're coming up on our one hour mark. We're at 55, 56 minutes actually, technically. So do you have any final thoughts on this topic there, Ben? I think we covered a lot of good aspects off it. Uh, it, this would be a great campfire discussion. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. No, everything's a great campfire discussion. That is true. <laughs> There's no such but thing as no, campfire. It's, uh, it, it is a great subject and I think we could drone on about it for hours, honestly. Uh, but I think we hit the main points here. Uh, and like I always we say, you know, get out there, have fun. Uh, be prepared for what you plan on doing. Uh, test all your gear. Test yourself. Uh, never hurts to, uh, if, you're, if you're on shore, put that piece of gear on and go for a walk, you know, in your own neighborhood. Just walk around the block a bunch of times just to see, you know, how is that going to affect my exhaustion? How is that going to affect... My, my back, my, my ankles, whatever may be bothering you. Uh, and test your gear. You know, how do those boots fit? How does that pack work? And it's easier to find those problems out at home than it is five miles in the woods. Um, yeah, so I think that covers it. All right, fair enough. And I really have no final t uh, comments on it either. Uh, I think it's all been said. We're kind of, like Ben said, we, we could go on about the, like most of our topics, we could talk nonstop. That's why we do this. Ben and I love to talk. Sometimes we get a little out of control. <laughs> but no, I think it was a good topic. And yeah, so let's hear from you guys. What's your thoughts on some of this? Uh, if you haven't been paying attention to our Facebook page, we now have the workings of our website up and working to some degree, AtlanticBushcraft.ca. We've always had the domain. It used to just be uh, our podcast, but since we have switched to YouTube and Anchor, we now have a web page with some information on it that leads back to all our sources of media. And if you do want to contact us, more importantly, I finally got this working properly. At the very bottom of the page, you will see a contact us spot, which will open a form, and you guys can just shoot us off any of your thoughts and Stuff like that. If you have a comment on this show, a previous show, an idea for a show, if you want to be a guest on a show, if you think you have something to contribute, we love to hear from you guys. So as always, look us up on our website, our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, YouTube, our email, podcast at AtlanticBushcraft.ca. Reach out to us and let us know what your guys' thoughts are. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, as always, thanks to everybody that joined us tonight. We have our regulars, Gary, Steve, uh, I was just about to say Ben, but of course, Ben, uh, I think Bushcraft Nick and Mr. Angles or Anglers or something like that. He, he was on earlier. I don't see him there anymore, but yeah, thanks to everybody that joined us and be sure to come back next week at the same time, same channel. And, uh, hopefully we'll have something better or something good for you that week too. Bushcraft time, same Bushcraft channel. Same bushcraft. I didn't want to say the actual line, although it was in the tip of my tongue because I didn't know what that would do to us. But anyway, same bushcraft time, same bushcraft channel. <laughs> Night, everybody. Night, <laughs>